From the St. Francis Yacht Club in San Francisco, this is the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Hosted by Ron Young. Welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, live from the virtual grill room of the St. Francis Yacht Club. We hope that you and yours are safe, sheltering in place during this long pandemic, and we look forward to joining you back in our Yacht Club just as soon as conditions permit. We can't be sure if that'll be in July or August as we wait for the city of San Francisco to make their policy decisions, but we look forward to greeting you there as soon as possible. Now, lots of us during the pandemic have been wondering about the post-pandemic economy. When we look around and hunt for folks to give us uh, some advice on that subject, I don't think we could do better than our speaker today. He got an undergraduate degree from UC Santa Barbara, and those of us who've raced down the coast always love it when the coastal race ends in Santa Barbara. It's beautiful. And then he went on to UC Berkeley to get a dual program PhD in public policy and economics. Chief U.S. Economist for Berenberg Capital Markets and on the Shadow Open Markets Committee and an economic advisor to several public organizations. Mickey Levy, welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And, you know, you would think that economics and sailing aren't a good mix. But when you think about it, sailing is all about the seas and understanding the winds and the environment. But, you know, economics is all about understanding the environment, dealing with the unexpected, dealing with risks and uncertainty and managing but not over managing. And, and then you would add something else. Um, you also, in, in, whether you're sailing or you're or an economic policymaker, you know, you really have to have a long run vision. So you add all that up, you know, the U.S. is recovering and now policies have to adjust. So the U.S. has really enjoyed a V-shaped recovery much more rapid than earlier forecasts and the fastest among all advanced nations. When we look at the components, consumption is booming along with housing. Government purchases have added a lot. At the same time, as we know, there's been unprecedented government federal deficit spending, and the Federal Reserve has followed a more expansive monetary policy than, than ever before. What I'd like to convey to you is the near-term economic outlook is very favorable, but the emergency government policies that were put in place involve high risks and high costs, and they must be unwound. Just like when you're exiting extremely high seas and you had in place emergency sailing instructions, now once you come out of that, you've got to shift gears. And so when I stand back and think about what I see, I believe in the resilience and resourcefulness and astounding ability of the U.S. economy to innovate. It, it just, it's unrivaled. But I have deep concerns about the government's willingness foresight and ability to steer economic policies on the right course from here. And, and it, is, it is a major concern of mine. Now, when we look at the pandemic shock, the steepest contraction ever, but the contraction in terms of jobs lost or furloughed, decline in economic activity less than almost all other countries. And I would add up the government's responses, which added up to legislation of 27% of GDP warlike in magnitude. They were well-intentioned, particularly the CARES Act of, of March 2020, but since then poorly designed, over the top, and there'll be a lot of history books written on this, pointing out how they could have done things much better rather than being driven by uh, politics and short-sightedness. Most of the income transfers from the government that supported spending were largely saved. And that's because in the recent legislation, the government was cutting checks, the majority of which went to individuals that already had jobs and already had sufficient savings. So when we hit the pandemic and the government shutdown, which is part of the healthcare policy response, it was the proper role of the government to provide income support. But when we step back, a lot of it was poorly designed and misallocated. And we know the Federal Reserve's policy, zero interest rates, massive purchases of U.S. Treasury and mortgage-backed securities. The Fed is purchasing over half of all the new bonds issued to finance the deficits. And this unfortunately had the biggest boost to financial markets and housing. Um, with residual costs. And, and I would add a critical element here, and that is the Fed 
while it's trying to help out all it can and be inclusive, it has actually accentuated wealth and income inequality. Consumer spending has been quite interesting. Now, because of all the government's income supports, disposable incomes after taxes actually rose significantly, even though the unemployment rate soared. And consumption of goods, that is durable, non-durable goods, they have soared above pre-pandemic levels. And now you see uh, spending on services are catching up as the economy reopens. So if we think about it, there's a lot of pent-up demand. There's a lot of consumer purchasing power. Personal savings, the stock of savings, is now about $2.5 trillion above its pre-pandemic levels. And it's basically sitting in bank accounts and the stock market waiting to be spent. And, and then we have to keep in mind, as the services economies reopen, as we start going out to public events, restaurants and bars and the like, that generates hot rehiring. Which, which supports uh, disposable income and confidence. And just a t- statistic I love, and that is household net worth in the US, controlling for all debt is $140 trillion. It's just a stunning number. The US is a very wealthy country based on our outperformance. So this just shows on the left, in the red line, you see consumption of goods way above where it was pre-pandemic, consumption of services below but catching up, And then the right-hand side shows how disposable income, which got these big spikes up with the government's checks and other support, you see the gap between that and consumption, and that gap has accumulated into tremendous amount of saving. So on the left chart, you have a comparison of the red line consumption of goods and a blue line consumption of services. And I I index those to January 2020, right before the pandemic. So you see the sharp declines and then the rebounds. So in the left-hand chart, you see the red line consumption of goods is way, way, way above where it had been, about 17% higher, whereas consumption of services are still not quite back to where they had been. So if we look at the right-hand slide, you see two lines, real or inflation-adjusted disposable personal income, which you see after the pandemic in the gray area, that is deep recession, you see these spikes that reflected the government's checks. They wrote to people and other income support. So you see these big jolts up and these are measured month to month. So you can see when the first check went out last April, the the more recent check in, in March of 2021, and then you see what actually happened in the blue line to consumption. The scale is trillions. So that's $20 trillion. If you look at the last observation, yeah. um, you have uh, real disposable income, which is a flow. It's a little over $16 trillion, and consumption, which is a little less than $13 trillion. So if we think about the stock, the, the, the flow of saving is the gap between those two. And then the stock of saving that I referred to, $2.5 trillion above where it had been, is the accumulation of that. So it's really quite interesting that we go through this um, unprecedented contraction and soaring of the unemployment rate, yet because of the government transfer payments, um, um, you see disposable after-tax income went up. And of course that helps support consumption, but the, the vast majority of the government transfer payments were saved because so many of the checks went to people who were already working. And what's the index across the bottom, Mickey? It goes 06 to- Excuse me, those are years. 2006, you see the first gray area, that was the financial crisis of 2008, nine, and now the pandemic began in the first quarter of 2020. Why does the blue line go down so steeply at the same time as the personal income goes up so steeply? Well, Ron, what were you doing last March and April? Wasn't buying anything at all. You're right. But so what you're saying is what happened was all the government checks come just a moment after? Is that? I just... No, it's not that. It's, it's the government was providing income support to individuals and small businesses. And the people who were unemployed needed those checks and they spent it, but there were enough other people who were not at work, not using their credit cards, not buying cars, et cetera, et cetera. So consumption 
temporarily fell sharply for two, just fell out of bed for a couple months. And now it's bounced back significantly. Once again, as I show on the left-hand side, it, the, the consumption of goods, that is, you know, autos and household durables and recreational goods has bounced back dramatically while consumption of services has lagged and, but is now catching up as economies are reopening up and people are getting back to normal. Got it. Perfect. Great. What a really fascinating set of charts. You know, it's, it's, it's really amazing how people live during the, during the pandemic. Um, and, and but you see that on the right hand chart, this sizable gap between real or inflation adjusted disposable personal income that was boosted by government income support and then the actual consumption. And so, so the, the gap between those two is is saving. And so, as I mentioned, there's two and a half trillion dollars higher saving sitting in bank accounts in the stock market than it existed just two years ago. And as confidence comes back, as the economy reopens and, and jobs in the services industry come back, my strong hunch, along with the monetary and fiscal stimulus, is a lot of that savings will be spent. And so if I had to identify the most critical issue facing the economy, uh, oh, say in the next year, is what happens to spending in the economy after this reopening spurt. And my belief is based on the pent up demand, the excess savings, and also this unprecedented monetary and fiscal stimulus, the economy aggregate demand spending, not just by households, but also by businesses will remain pretty strong even after the economy reopens. Now, housing, everybody's favorite topic. The <laughs> fundamentals, both the cyclical factors and the demographic factors are very, very strong. New family formation, the low mortgage rates, the, the, the job creation decline in unemployment rates, um, and also the work at home mindset is boosting demand. And what's so striking here is there's a housing boom in many small and medium sized cities that's never occurred before, and I think it's likely to, to continue. And so when we look at the industry, there's insufficient inventories, and this has cons actually constrained home sales in the last couple of months. Builders can't even keep up with strong demand. And at the same time, there's nearly as much spending on home improvements as there is total spending on new construction. So think about all the people who move out of their house, sell it, and move, move somewhere else or buy a second house. Um, people who move in, they do undergo vast improvements, uh, renovations and the like. And so what all this adds up to is soaring home prices. And keep in mind, just like you know, the, the, the debt finance housing bubble of the 2000s, expectations that prices are gonna rise further is increasing demand. So the bad news is construction costs are way up. The good news for builders is because product demand is so strong, they can pass on, on the, through the higher costs. Um, so I leave it with a question here. Housing's going to remain strong for a couple of years. You've had a shock to the economy. Don't expect it to the, the reverberations to end right away. It'll, it'll continue. But I ask the following question. Amid housing froth, why is the Fed continuing to buy mortgage-backed securities and subsidize the mortgage market? Question mark. Now, this just shows a picture of, of what's going on in housing from the broadest perspective. The red line is on the left axis. That's about 5.6 million existing home sales. New home sales is about 800,000. Look at how both lines have come down in the last three or four months. That reflects insufficient supply. There's just not enough new homes being built. There's just not enough people willing to sell their houses even at higher prices here. So as you see, I'm expecting the housing boom to continue, but look at the left-hand chart where we measure from the year 2000 to, the, to current with the recession shaded. You see in the red line, uh, existing home sales. 
that is, you know, just in the secondary market, people selling their current homes, that's measured on the left-hand axis with thousands. So it's, it's about 5.8 million. The blue line is single one family houses sold new ones. That is new construction sold. And it's a little less than 800,000. But look at how both volumes have declined in the last three months, three, four months. And this reflects lack of supply in both um, existing homes and new homes. There just aren't enough houses for sale or they would be sold because we all know how strong demand is. Now, the right-hand chart shows new housing starts, that is those that have been permitted to start, and it's up to about 1.6 million, which you see is even below where it was 20 years ago. And meanwhile, you know, as we all know, housing demand is increasing, and um, you know, some older houses, um, you know, they get old and they depreciate. That is just like any other asset, they depreciate. And there's just not enough home building right now. Um, and, and meanwhile, you have new family formation and, and younger people are demanding houses. So what I don't show here, Ron, is what uh, something quite interesting. Right now, in the U.S., there are about 56 million people over 60 years old. And that number is skyrocketing with the demographic. This is the baby boom. We're talking. Yes. About. And as you can imagine, you know, if you think about people who are 60, then 70, then 80 years old, eventually they move into townhouses or, you know, senior living facilities and the like. And every one of those houses that they sell are going to require renovations. And so housing is a big sector and it's going to continue to be strong. Now, employment. So when we add up consumption, and I didn't get into capital spending by businesses, but if you think about how activity I mentioned is a V-shaped recovery, while GDP, that is gross domestic product output, is almost all the way back up, employment has rebounded, but not it's, it's a little slower. So here it shows from 1990 to the present on the left-hand side, total non-farm payrolls, that is the establishment survey. Um, um, we lost, if you, know, if you look at this red line, in two months, we lost 23 million jobs. And now we've recovered about 16 million of those. And in the last couple of months, most of the increases have been in the service producing sectors. If you look at sectors like construction and uh, manufacturing, they're almost all the way back to where they were. Help us understand the numbers on the on the scale, the vertical scale on the left. It says 163 zeros. What does that mean? As I've described, the economy has output has really recovered in a V-shaped and GDP is all the way back to where it was before the pandemic. But employment, as you can see in the left-hand chart, it fell sharply and has now bounced back about 70% of the way. Now, this chart shows the establishment survey of non-farm payrolls, add three zeros to the end, and, and the, the left and right hand axis are, you know, the, the top one is 160 million. So you can see employment in two months during the depths of the pandemic fell by 23 million. You've bounced back 16 million of those. And now what we're seeing is as the economy reopens, you know, most of the gains now are in leisure and hospitality, you know, health and, and, and education services. So that'll bounce back all the way uh, eventually. But I have to tell you, the, the rebound has been much quicker than anybody had anticipated. And the right hand chart shows the unemployment rate, which shot up dramatically. Once again, it went from three and a half percent to uh, nearly 15 percent and is now down to 5.9%, and it's going to come down further. So this just shows you how dramatic it is, but some people are still unemployed. So once again, we've had this recovery that has far exceeded expectations, and it's going to continue to grow very, very nicely. And so now we're going to get to this issue that we've, we're all aware of, and that is inflation. And it's, and it's pretty controversial. And so the debate is this inflation we're seeing now. So all of the inflation numbers, the consumer price index and the personal consumption expenditure price index, 
those have increased significantly in the last year and, and, and they've actually accelerated in the last six months. And if you look at producer costs, they've accelerated sharply. The Federal Reserve um, argues that these increases are temporary and will fall back down. My view is it's a combination. The price increases are a combination of temporary factors and more persistent inflation pressures. And so when we think about the temporary factors, um, supply chain and distribution bottlenecks, um, we all know about semiconductors limiting the supply of automobiles, bicycles, things like that. Also, labor supply is being constrained. Some people are uncomfortable going back to work. Others would rather collect their government check than, than go back to work. But when we think about what drives inflation, the Fed's very aggressive monetary ease and all this extreme fiscal stimulus. And so the second bullet point here is, is exceedingly important. And that is, if after the economy enjoys its reopening spurt, which we're in the middle of now, if the economy remains strong, that is, if the unprecedented monetary and fiscal stimulus actually generates strong demand as it's intended, then inflation pressures will mount and persist. And let me add a little color to that. Um, right now, production costs are going up. There are some supply and distribution bottlenecks. Businesses are raising prices. If all of this monetary and fiscal stimulus actually are successful in stimulating the economy as the Fed projects they will, and I project they will, then businesses with the strong aggregate demand ongoing will have the flexibility to raise product prices in order to maintain their margins and not lose market share. And that's the more persistent part of it. And I don't want to go into details here, but you know, monetary economists talk about money supply M2, which is a fancy economics term for bank deposits. And these, these have increased 31% since March of 2020. And, and I think a lot of them will end up being spent and stimulate that demand. And um, you know, the government stimulus checks, the, the checks to individuals aren't going out, but, but a lot of states haven't spent all of the federal grants they've received. Um, the Biden administration is still um, um, pushing for more uh, deficit spending in the form of its infrastructure package and Families Act. And so I think the, this is the critical question. I think the economy will remain fairly strong even after it reopens. Now, the critical point here, and it's the second to last bullet, let's be clear about this. Um, inflation is harmful to the economy. The Fed wants and higher inflation because they, th they thought it was too low and reduced their, uh, they got them too close to the, what they call the zero lower bound in interest rates. And they wanted to ensure they had flexibility to respond to the next recession. I think, I think that's, they're fighting the last battle. And so this higher inflation we're seeing, let's face the facts. It hits lower income households the most. They don't have the flexibility the transportation network, et cetera, et cetera, to shop around and get the lowest prices. Also, by the Fed keeping policy rates at zero, keeping bond yields so low, let's think about what it does. It pushes up home values. Who owns the houses? Higher income people. Who has to rent? Lower income people. So it pushes up their rent. So I think this is contributing to some of the social unrest. Here's a reason when we think about the risks of the Fed continuing to do what it's doing, it's not just excessive stimulus that leads to higher inflation, but it's what it's doing to the social fabric that I think is very important. So the inflation risk here is over stimulus. And, and you know, the Fed is hanging its hat because it's relying on the post-financial crisis when inflation stayed very subdued. And I and I you know, it's almost like when, when sailing through an, an unexpected turbulent period and you emerge from it, you say, oh, last time, you know, we tilted this way or that way and everything was fine. So let's just do that same thing again. So we'll see. These just show pictures and I won't go into detail. You can just see on the far right how 
you know, inflation on the CPI has accelerated. This shows six month annualized. And on the right, producer prices, you see these big accelerations. So one of the striking items in financial markets is bond yields have remained very low and below inflation despite the economic recovery and these deeply negative real rates are inconsistent with economic history. And you know, bond yields are much higher now than they were last October, but you would think with the stronger economic recovery that historically has pushed up real rates and the higher inflation, you would think bond yields would be higher. So as you can imagine, the negative real rates are creating a lot of distortions in economic and financial behavior. What are the factors keeping them low? Well, the Fed's zero rates and its purchases of treasuries and mortgage-backed securities, foreign demand, and expectations maybe the economy is going to decelerate. But when we add it all up, my expectation is when the Fed announces that it's going to begin to normalize policies and stop wind down its purchases, then I think bond yields will rise. Um, and I would say the biggest risk is bond yields never rise gradually in exactly the way you would anticipate. Financial markets can gyrate a lot in the near term. So the risk is if the economy remains strong, as I expect, and infl inflation pressures mount, then the stock market has to deal with that. And this just shows Ron, measured on the left, and I go way, way back here to 1965 to the present, I show 10-year Treasury bond yields and the core CPI, excluding the volatile food and energy components. And you can see this downward drift in inflation from the early 80s. And now you've seen this jump up in inflation at the end. And you've seen these really low bond yields to the point where bond yields have fallen below inflation. On the right-hand side, measured since 2006, I show the Treasury's inflation index bonds. The deeply negative inflation index bond is, is really quite striking and, in my view, unsustainable. Now, the stock market, everybody's favorite topic when they're not out sailing. Um, <laughs> you know, maybe when, maybe when you are out sailing, but when I, when I, when I go fishing or my distance biking, um, I don't think about these things, <laughs> but, but um, okay. So the chart shows just since 2017, I show the NASDAQ, which is, you know, all the, the growth stocks and the, the tech stocks in red. And I show the S and P 500, but I index both of them to January, 2020 equals a hundred. So you can see how they've both gone up a lot. Now, why the increase before the before the pandemic? Why the sharp bounce back? Well, first, very strong rebound in profits, and I would note that you know profits fluctuate by magnitudes more than GDP. Okay. Second, of course, the zero interest rates, the Fed asset purchases, and the Fed signals that they're going to they're going to do more of the same. And the, as I mentioned in the last slide, lower bond yields. So what's the outlook? And we can't be definitive here. Um, and I don't pretend to be a stock market strategist, although I don't really quite know what they do. Um, <laughs> um, when, the outlook. We we, have we, the, on behalf of all of our stock brokers, I have to ask you, what is the difference between an astrologer and an economist? <laughs> well... <laughs> An honest economist explains what he or she uh, knows from economic theory and practice um, and, and, and carefully explains what they don't know. And that's what I, that's what I try to do. But the outlook, you're going to see two factors that are kind of tugging and pulling at each other. The Fed's going to gradually unwind its emergency policies and, and bond yields are likely to rise, but the profits are still gonna stay strong. So you see this tugging and pulling and um, you know, a lot's gonna depend on you know, the sustained strength of the economy. I do note that I haven't mentioned this, but you know, along with the dramatic increases in government spending, the Biden administration is proposing significantly higher taxes 
And here I would, I would note something very important. All of the tax increase proposals put forth by Biden are higher taxes on capital. That is on corporations, okay? And in addition on, on high income people who tend to own the corporations. And let's, let's just use some economic common sense. Uh, corporations and high income individuals that own corporations, when they, when they face higher taxes, they translate it, that into lower expected rates of return on capital and they respond, they adjust their behavior, businesses adjust their capital spending plans and, and their hiring and their wages. And so we just don't know yet the impact of the higher, the combination of the higher taxes and the more government spending on the economy. But I just wanna emphasize, you know, the, the stocks are going up because profits go up three times more than GDP and, and bond yields have stayed low. And what we, have to, what we have to see in the next year is how the markets deal with the tug and pull between the Fed normalizing, but we hope continued rise in profits. So very quickly here, the Fed's current policies are inconsistent with this long run objectives. And as I've noted, they do distort markets and the economy. And the longer you keep rates at zero and distort behavior, the higher are the risks of financial instability. So very quickly, the Fed has had in place since March of 2020 emergency policies. We're no longer in an emergency. Um, that's clear by all the economic data. So the Fed has to exit. It has to unwind. So if you look at its current policies of zero rates and quantit QE or quantitative easing, asset pur purchases of treasuries and MBS, these are inconsistent with the Fed's long run objectives. They distort markets and they increase the risk of financial instability in ways we really don't know. Now, the Fed, as I've mentioned, favors high inflation, but let's face the facts. And I, I speak to various Fed members. Um, the Fed is basically scared that normalizing policies will jar financial markets in the economy. So it's going to tiptoe toward normalizing. So what do I expect the Fed will do? You know, I would say later this summer or the fall, it'll announce a gradual tapering of its asset purchases. There's a typo here. It's supposed to say taper in 2022. And then ever so gradually begin raising rates in later 2022. And if we think about, or if the Fed thinks about what is a normal federal funds rate, it's not zero. The Fed thinks of it as about two and a half or about a half a percentage point above its inflation target. So the, even as the Fed begins to hike rates, while the market will talk about monetary tightening, take it with a grain of salt and in relative terms. Uh, until they get to two and a half, they'll still be easier than normal. Ron, the, the risk we face here is if inflation goes up and looks like it's persistent uh, in defiance of what the Fed has been arguing, and you get continued strong growth, then the Fed's, then the Fed's on the hot seat and has to, has to adjust more quickly. Now, the notion that extreme deficit spending like we've been through is costless, is false and dangerous, okay? So the bottom line is if you look at all of the government's deficit spending in the last year and a half in response to the pandemic, but even the deficit increasing that's added to the debt in recent decades, most of the spending increases are government transfer payments and once again, that while that was some of that was necessary and, a, and an appropriate role of, of the government during the pandemic, um, these um, transfer payments they increase debt service they increase debt and debt service costs, but they 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 really fuel current consumption and don't add to long run productive capacity. And so, basically. This deficit spending isn't costless. It depends on how you're allocating national resources. And I recoil when I hear policymakers talk about, become fixated on a number like 1.9 trillion. 
without thinking about how it involves allocating national resources and the burdens it's putting on future generations. Now, the potential costs, we just don't know, but they potentially include higher inflation, higher interest rates, and dampening of longer run sustainable growth, a weaker dollar, et cetera, et cetera. And let me just juxtapose the US with Europe. The countries have much higher government spending and taxes as a percent of GDP. They have much higher regulations. So they have more income support, but they have dramatically slower economic growth year after year. And that accumulates and affects standards of living. And so um, let's just put it this way. The Biden administration's proposals, and right now it's, it's, it has on the table the American Jobs Act, or its infrastructure initiative, and the American Families Plan uh, Act. Uh, and these would dramatically raise, expand the size and scope of government. They would provide more income support, but we have to acknowledge there is a trade-off between the size of government income support and economic growth. And there's a happy medium. And maybe the US uh, is, is seeking that happy medium now, but I am very concerned about the short-sightedness of our fiscal policy makers. And so let me summarize here, you know, the stepping back from the pandemic, the emerging from the, the rough pandemic seas to where we are now, you know, so the US has by far the highest sustainable growth among all advanced nations. It's resilient, it's resourceful, has a great track record of innovation. It does have income and wealth inequalities and many social issues. I think the policymakers are addressing these challenges very unconstructively and not in a way that could really enhance our standards of living and making and make us more cohesive. Fiscal policy is truly misguided and on the wrong track. Uh, because many fiscal policymakers don't assume any costs. And keep in mind here, the Federal Reserve keeping rates at zero encourages uh, deficit spending and, and, and subsidizes it. And um, so, so my, when I step back from all this, my expectation is, you know, private entrepreneurship is going to continue, but I think government policies are going to muddle. Let's leave it at that and say, stay tuned. Great. Thanks very much, Mickey. Very uh, thoughtful presentation. Uh, we're most appreciative. Now, I have to quickly ask, since we've been in the pandemic and most people have been working from home, you're working not from inside an office building inside of Manhattan. Looks to me like, did I understand you're in your beach house on West Hampton? Is that right? No, that, that, that's right. And Ron, I'm I'm in my little office overlooking the overlooking the dunes and the and the um, Atlantic Ocean, but my productivity has been very high for a year and a quarter, and I've been more creative. So, you know, if if my firm insists that I come back five days a week, they can expect lower productivity and and less creativity. Thank you for providing thousands of our viewers with a really great explanation for why they should be able to continue working from their beach houses. This is very important, very important service. Um, so, Mickey, if you if we go up to a couple hundred thousand feet and we look at the overall meta effect of the pandemic, has it caused massive consolidation of businesses as mama papa businesses went out of business? Or just tell me, what is the meta effect on businesses by the pandemic? One answer is we don't really know yet because after a big shock, uh, sometimes it takes years and even a decade to really sort things out. Um, there have been a lot of small businesses that have gone out of business, but there will be a lot of rebirth and generation of small businesses. And that is just beginning. And I would say, if you look back through U.S. history, during deep recessions, even the depression of the 1930s, there was an acceleration in technological innovations. That's happening right now. 
So we just have to stay tuned. So, so the U.S. economy, once again, is very resourceful. And I wouldn't say one of the outcomes is more corporate consolidation. I would say a lot of destruction of smaller businesses, but a lot of rebirth, a lot of business thinking through issues like uh, more flexible work and working at home, more aggressive use of new technological innovations. And then let me add one final point. In this area of medical services and technological advance, I mean, if we think about what's happened since last May, that is following March and April, the number one news story was this extraordinary development of vaccines that all the scientists at the time told us it would take five years. This is all part of the U.S. resourcefulness. And and so what we can expect is productivity and innovations in the medical field is going to lead us down paths that we didn't think would exist a couple of years ago. So those are positives that come out of it. And then for those, you know, who who did lose their jobs, um, some of them will find better jobs and some will struggle. And once again, it has been the proper role of the government to provide support. Um, my criticism is after the first CARES Act in March of 2020, the government officials should have taken a deep breath and say, what's the best way to provide support to those who really need it rather than just cut checks to everybody? Um, so stay tuned. The, the, the story on the economic impact of the pandemic is not over yet. In that particular case, would you have proposed checks to lower income people, direct checks to, to them based upon income level or assets? Oh boy, you're, you're bringing out a great question. Um, you know, I, of course, there were income break even levels. I wish they would have been lower. And, and I think the government policymakers didn't think about how to provide necessary support to those who really needed it while not discouraging the work effort of others. And that's the problem we're running into now where too many people are accepting you know, enhanced unemployment compensation and not going back to work. And we see that in a wide array of, of, of industries. So once again, the government, the policymakers, you hear it on the news, they just talk in polemics and they don't really understand what the issues are. Uh, I want to talk about the office space. So you're speaking from your home in West Hampton on the beach, and I'm uh, speaking to you from Mill Valley, California. Um, are we going to go back to our offices? Uh, what's going to happen to office rentals, essentially? That's the real question. Uh, is office rental space going to take a while to recover? Or how do you see, um, you know, the forecast for those that issue? Ron, I think, I think, um, res, uh, um, um, commercial space, it's going to vary by city. And in some cities, uh, presumably including San Francisco, but certainly including New York and Chicago and LA, rental values on commercial space has already come down. But they'll refill with other businesses at you know, lower prices. We're already starting to see that in, in New York. It'll take it'll take a while. And and then when I say it varies by city, some medium and small sized cities, you know, they don't have these, you know, 50 story high rises. They're affected by much less. So you can't generalize. So the government response to this pandemic, how did it compare to the response to the Great Depression, you know, a half a century, 70 years ago when uh, the Great Depression started in the 30s? Let's just go back to the financial crisis of 2008 9. The magnitude of government deficit spending now and the Federal Reserve's response both are magnitudes higher than the responses in 2008-9. Magnitudes. Even as a percent of GDP? As a percent of GDP. You go back to the 1930s, and the most striking fact was the Federal Reserve basically sat on its hands 
and let what began as a recession turn into a depression because it did all the wrong things. And that's been pretty well documented. Fiscal policy, there was a very slow response, very slow for several years. And then, um, you know, finally, um, there was a, a dramatic increase in the federal government uh, uh, spending with all of um, FDR's New Deal projects that, that created jobs and, you know, actually built things that were useful for the future. Um, now, at the same time, the Fed finally shifted gears and, and, and lifted the economy. So, so once again, the most striking thing is the Fed did all the wrong things back then, and this time around did a lot of the right things, and now it's time to exit. So now you talked about the rebound ahead of us because of the uh, built up savings and, um, you know, wealth in the markets. But you haven't talked about the economic benefit or impact of large government infrastructure projects. First of all, what do you think the likelihood is that big infrastructure projects, as proposed by the administration, will get through? And then what would be the downstream economic effects of those? Okay. I do think um, President Biden's, um, he calls it the um, American Jobs Act. Um, and that's the in infrastructure initiative. So you could tell by the title, they're using it to create uh, uh, jobs um, as well as you know, pave roads and build bridges. I do think it will pass. Um, I put a very high probability on it because um, both Republican and Democratic leadership favor it. The issue now is the Democratic leaders want to attach to that the um, American Families Plan Act, which, which provides a lot of um, income support initiatives. So once it passes, that's just budget authorization for infrastructure projects and it will be spent over a number of years. And so the way that that will add to jobs as the money's been spent, and it'll add to GDP as the money's spent. The issue is how much will it really add to the nation's productive capacity? Of course, we all would like to you know, ride down roads that are smooth and go over bridges that are safe, but the question is how much does it really add to longer run productive capacity, Ron, there the issue depends. It depends on what projects are picked, how they're administered, how they're supervised, and they're, you know, what they look like when they're done. So once again, I mentioned earlier, I really don't like the way fiscal policymakers fixate on a total number without thinking of what they really want to achieve. And as far as I can tell, there has been far too little thought put into how they're going to administer these programs, how the federal government is going to allocate monies. And, and, and it's those details that are going to determine how much they add to economic activity in the future beyond the actual spending that will definitely increase jobs and economic activity as the monies are being spent. So we've seen an acceleration in ransomware attacks on the U.S. economy. Uh, can you see um, potential government policies that would you know, diminish the likelihood of such cybercrime in the future? I think it is a critical role of the government to understand cybersecurity, ransomware, and how it works, but I don't think it should um, clamp down on cryptocurrencies and the like. Those, those are just natural consequences of the technology, how the technological advances in, in finance. But you're getting to, to me to an, a critical point here. And that is, when we think about infrastructure and the government's 
role in improving infrastructure. My view of infrastructure isn't just roads and bridges. It's, you know, the electrical grid and its air traffic control and its cybersecurity. Because these are public goods and they're part of our modern day infrastructure. And there's, a, there's definitely a role for the government to monitor it, supervise it, but not over-regulate it. And there's a role of the government to fund research in it, because this is part of our, our current and future infrastructure. Mickey, we heard for decades during the 80s and 90s about trickle-down economics. And um, what, what is the effect of trickle-down economics and compare it to what some might call bubble-up economics? In other words, what if you distribute money to the middle or the bottom of the, um, of the society versus the top of the society and help us with, understand the two effects? Trickle-down economics, and I don't like the term, but it is basically managing aggregate demand in the economy through monetary and fiscal policy while allowing entrepreneurship and capitalism to generate productive advances that generates jobs and employment and wages. And that's the trickle down the, 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 the trickle up approach is, oh, just give money to lower income people, but at the same time, regulate and stifle innovations and big businesses. And that doesn't work. So the, na the name of the game in economics is conducting policies by policies monetary policy, fiscal policies, regulatory policies that increase sustainable productive growth. And that's what enriches a society. Um, it's not over managing the economy and giving money to some and having the government determine who should be the beneficiaries of what, you know, government transfer payment and then stifling everything else. That that's a that's a recipe for the type of um, muddle through slower growth that, that, that Europe has endured for, you know, decades now. So I think there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a big difference here. And so, so this gets back to, you know, when, when, I, when I compared economics to sailing, um, you know, you not only have to understand the seas and the winds and the economic environment, you re you're really guided best if you have a long-term vision. So Mickey Levy, Chief Economist for the Americas in Asia for Berenberg Capital Markets, thank you very much for sharing your insight and uh, thoughtful perspective on the post-pandemic economy. We really appreciate time you spent with the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. This has been a presentation of the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon.